Greetings, friends, and welcome back to another episode of Augury, Bibliomancy, and Chaos. I am Benjamin, the Wizard of Your Dreams, and today I will be your guide as we journey into the mind of Sigmund Freud, perhaps one of the most famous and controversial practitioners in the history of psychology. Here he is, and boy, he does not look happy. That, that is, that's the guy you would expect to come up with some of the theories that he did. And before uh, we get to the main article, which is uh, here from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Yes, I guess we're just reading out of the encyclopedia because why not? Um, I did want to give you a little bit of background on this fellow. So he is uh, for, uh, contemporary with the American Civil War, born in 1856, died in 1939. He was an Austrian neurologist. Uh, so. Uh, if anyone remembers, yes, he's a real doctor. Uh, so, trained in um, uh, real medical uh, medical knowledge, uh, neurology of the brain, um, back in the day, such uh, such as they could with the technology that they had. Um, he is most famous for uh, creating psychoanalysis, which was uh, uh, said to be at once a theory of the human psyche, a therapy. Uh, for the relief of its ills and an optic for the interpretation of culture and society. It's good stuff. Uh, first, also, before we get on to actually talking about Freud, a little valid criticism of his uh, psychoanalytic theory. So from this website here, um, criticism of Freud's psychoanalytic theory. One of the largest criticisms of psychoanalytic theory is that it places far too much emphasis on childhood. For one, Freud's theory says that personality development occurs during childhood, but many modern psychologists, myself included, say that this development is in fact lifelong. A similar criticism is that the minds of children do not attain as much trauma uh, as Freud linked to many psychological illnesses. Also, criticism has been raised uh, against Freudian slips saying that they do not arise from unconscious motives, but rather confusion in word retrieval in the memory, or it also, I've heard it said, uh, in, in speaking, um, fumbling for words, which I do quite often, so I'm very, very well aware of not exactly saying what I'm thinking and definitely not saying it well. Um, uh, also, Freud's ideas of repression are rebuked by most modern psychologists who say repression is a rare phenomenon and that intense stress and pain actually cause better remembrance of an event rather than the intensity of that pain uh, causing you to bury it and try to forget it. Not that it doesn't happen, but uh, it, it seems to work more one way than, uh, than the other. Um, one other criticism of his theory was directed at his idea of the unconscious mind, and this uh, relates to my dream work. Critics stated that the unconscious mind did not consist of hidden or repressed passionate emotions. Instead, it was underlying information such as cognition, memory, perception, as well as emotion, but generally not of the repressed kind. I'll take a little issue with that. It, it is repressed memory as well, uh, or <clears throat> but it's all of the above. It's a mixed bag. So back to the uh, article among Freud's earliest writings was the interpretation of dreams from 1899, which then, of course, also went through many subsequent revisions, in which Freud said, the interpretation of dreams is the royal road to a knowledge of the unconscious activities of the mind. Now, let's let you look at that for a minute while I take a drink. And here we have, uh, actually, this will be linked in the comments down below. Uh, a full copy of the 1900 version uh, PDF of The Interpretation of Dreams by Sigmund Freud. And we see here one of the most famous dream paintings. Uh, it was already famous in Freud's day and predated him by quite a bit. Uh, this is actually what um, the, the painter at the time envisioned when people described sleep paralysis. and how they felt like they had a creature and sometimes even saw a demon or demonic shadow creatures sitting on their chest, making it impossible or difficult to draw, draw a breath. Um, and this was, this was the depiction 
that came up with it, the nightmare. So you can read more about this here. And I would, if you're at all interested in this subject, read the whole thing. He, again, foundational guy. He came up with a lot of the theories that we use throughout psychology today. They've become so mainstream uh, that people have forgotten the source and people like to give Freud a hard time about that. Um, one, uh, actually, one other thing about Freud, and this, uh, go back here. You see the couch. It was very central to psycho psychoanalysis itself. His, his methodology for psychoanalysis um, is partly infamous for having a patient lay down on the couch and not make eye contact with the analyst, which, in my opinion, uh, was a method developed and employed by Freud because he had difficulty with social interaction. I personally think Freud was on the autism spectrum and um, specifically eye contact made it difficult for him to focus, kind of, kind of like me. Um, but I digress and we go back to the article here. Freud theorized that thinking during sleep tends to be primitive, regressive, repressed wishes, particularly those associated with sex and hostility were said to be released in dreams when the inhibitory demands of wakefulness were diminished, the content of the dream was said to derive from such stimuli as, in Freud's opinion, urinary pressure in the bladder, traces of experiences from the previous day, uh, which he called day residues, and associated infantile memories. The specific dream details were called their manifest content. The presumably repressed wishes uh, being expressed were called the latent content. And here is, um, now, I don't want to go there. Where am I heading next? Uh, here we jump over to uh, the material of dreams. So according to Freud in uh, his 1900 edition, sources of dreams include stimuli from the external world, subjective experiences, organic stimuli within the body, and mental activities during sleep. Empirical evidence has supported some of these assertions. The self-organization theory of dreaming posits that memory consolidation, emotional regulation, and the reception of external stimuli can contribute to dream content. Hence, dream content can contain important information about the dreamer. And that's what I think. Uh, we can all learn something from our dreams. Uh, if we pop over here to Frontiers in Psychology, this is an article link. We get. Um, a supplement to the self-organization theory of dreaming. Uh, this is from Kahn and Hobson. Um, their theory from 1993 proposed that dreams are a product of self-organization of the brain during sleep as a complex system far from uh, equilibrium state. The dreaming brain may form a new pattern by the interaction between components with or in the, which components within this system. At REM sleep stages, signals from neuronal clusters self-organize and form image fragments. Then the image fragments interact and produce images. And finally, these materials are associated into relatively continuous narratives. Now that is their uh, theory or conceptualization of it, and I think that is, is very important, has, uh, has some relevance. But Freud would say, uh, as much as we are self-organizing, that self-organizing has motivation. It comes from somewhere. There is some cause for it. So Freud said that um, uh, consistent with Freud's motivational account, dream content is casually or causally related to the, which, which is more than casual. Ca causal is almost the uh, opposite of casual. Ca causally related to the motivated affective life of the organism, no less than any other ordinary mental process. Freud writes that there is, of course, no such thing as arbitrary determination in the mind, um, which naturally extends to dreams. Uh, as he said, we regard nothing in a dream as accidental or indifferent, while organic sensations such as uh, indigestion may make some contribution to dream content. Dreams do not originate in the bodily sensations and such sensations are also not sufficient for explaining dream activity since they lack any motivational foundation. Instead, Freud believes that a wish is necessary for a dream, uh, for dream activity because it provides the motive force 
for it. And he says again, it is self-evident that dreams must be wish fulfillments, since nothing but a wish can set our mental apparatus at work. The term force is open to interpretation, but since dreaming involves attending to some objects and events, and not others, Freud is essentially proposing that motivation is the key for explaining why someone dreams of X while ignoring Y. And uh, back to the article here. Um, Freud believed all the linguistic instruments of subtle thought are dropped and abstract terms are taken back to the concrete. The copious employment of symbols for representing certain objects and processes is in harmony with the regression of the mental apparatus and the demands of censorship. Freud submitted that one aspect of manifest content could come to represent a number of latent elements and vice versa through a process he called condensation and I've got here just the Wikipedia page pulled up for all of us in Freudian psychology, a condensation, uh, the, the, an, an episode or instance of condensation in the German. Let's see if I can do, the, do this. Verdictung, condensation, is when a single idea, an image, a memory, a thought, or a dream object stands for several associations and ideas. And that's part of what I do in my work is focusing in on those objects the behaviors, the specific imagery, and trying to pull that meaning out, and then kind of, I'm doing a pulling taffy motion, uh, trying to connect it to to uh, what else is going on, and, and, and generally create an overarching theme, if possible, not always possible. Uh, back to the article here. Further displacement of emotional attitudes towards one object or person theoretically could be displaced in dreaming uh, to another object or person or may not appear at all in the dream. Freud further observed a process called secondary elaboration, which occurs when people wake and try to remember dreams. Uh, they may recall inaccurately in the process of elaboration and rationalize and provide the dream a smooth facade or by omission display rents and cracks this waking activity he called secondary revision. And I actually, I think I pulled up, maybe I didn't pull up another definition of that, but uh, the important point was my process via the question and answer portion of seeking details helps try to um, overcome this problem of secondary revision by putting the dreamer as much as possible back into the dreaming, uh, the experience of the dream as fully as possible with exceedingly tiny and sometimes what may end up being irrelevant details, but that's what gets us back to the original dream and not the story we kind of tell ourselves after we wake up, which uh, you've probably noticed that if you've listened to some of my other episodes, people, uh, the five or 10 minutes they'll tell a dream and we'll spend an hour pulling out a lot more than they expected would would actually be there. Uh, I need some water. Ask me. Moving on. <clears throat> In seeking the latent meaning of dreams, Freud advised the individual to associate freely about it. Uh, you'll see me doing that as well. Just asking people, what what does that make you feel? How did you feel about that? What did what did you see? What do you think that's connected to? Kind of freely associate. Dreams thus represent another source of uh, free association, famous in psychoanalysis. From listening to these associations, the analyst was supposed to determine what the dream represented, in part through an understanding of the personal needs and experiences of the dreamer. Using this information, the analyst could help the patient overcome inhibitions that were identified through dream work. And not just um, inhibitions, but wish fulfillment, like personal personal drives. And that can there can be things holding you back and, and there can be ob obstacles, uh, uh, you know. And it's not that these things are necessarily repressed, pushed pushed down, although that's a valid way of looking at it. It's, it's more that there's, um, there's unknown roadblocks, perhaps, or roadblocks that are known to your subconscious 
but you haven't put those pieces together mentally in, in a cognitive way in your, in your conscious waking mind. So the dream's trying to tell you, pay more attention to this, here's how to fix your problems, and hopefully that's something I'm doing with people, uh, giving them useful information. Uh, otherwise, what am I even doing here? Uh, moving on, we talked a bit last time about uh, Carl Jung. We'll, we'll talk uh, more. Unlike Freud, Jung uh, did not view dreams as complementary to mental uh, waking, mental life with respect to specific instinctual impulses. Jung believed that dreams were uh, instead compensatory and in that they balanced whatever elements of character were underrepresented in the way people lived their lives. Uh, dreaming to Young, of course, represented a continuous 24-hour flow of mental activity that would surface in sleep under conducive conditions, but could also affect waking life when one's behavior denied important elements of one's true personality. Uh, in Young's view, then, dreams are constructed not to conceal or disguise forbidden wishes, but to bring the under-attended areas to attention. And again, that's my blending of Freud and Jung, uh, as well as other theories and processes, it's, it's both. Uh, the more you look at these things, the more you realize how amazingly complex they are. And each of these pieces is a piece of the puzzle. And when you put it together, it makes a picture bigger than a lot of these foundational um, doctors and psychologists and analysts even knew. They, they, they had no idea how important their pieces would become, but they knew they were onto something. And they they got it out there, and even if you have valid criticism, it's good to just get your material out there, say what you, honestly say what you believe to be true, and let the chips fall, <clears throat> fall where they may. Um, moving on here, uh, this function is carried out unconsciously in sleep when people are living emotionally well-balanced lives. If this is not the case, there may be uh, first bad moods and then symptoms in waking. Then and only then do dreams need to be interpreted this is best not done with a single dream and multiple free associations, but with a series of dreams so that the repetitive elements become apparent. But valid, not, not my process. I like to focus on one dream at a time and see what we can pull out of it. But it does become more meaningful, more relevant, more powerful. It becomes more useful the more data you have over time um, a single uh, what do they call it a single data point is not data it's an anecdote so kind of reducing dream uh, a dreamers full um, you wouldn't want to make any kind of large pronouncement about their entire life or give them definitive recommendations, advice on specific actions that they should necessarily take based on interpreting one dream. I try to be very careful with that and tell people, uh, hopefully this is useful, uh, but think about it more and think about how it relates to other things. And here's just something to think about. Here's something to know about yourself or something you're trying, ultimately you are trying to tell yourself. Anyway, I, uh, I can definitely ramble. Uh, what do we got here? I wanted to throw up real quick before we get to the conclusion Freud's uh, method for interpreting dreams. Uh, a couple of very key important things here which also speak to my perspective. Dreams do have meanings. Um, the science of Freud's time regarded dreams as meaningless. So we're going back to, again, the mid-1800s and there were doctors of a sort. I mean, there had been doctors for years, but the history of doctoring goes back to barbers and pulling teeth and uh, the, the basic wound care as best you could and, and before that into the shamanic um, witch doctor practices of tribal folks um, who also did dream interpretation. We'll get into that uh, at some point in, in the future, but by the time we hit the 1850s, people were very proper and scientific in this modern world and we haven't got time for that mystical mumbo jumbo and dreams they threw into the category of mystical mumbo jumbo but Freud brought it back and he said you know what I'm a real doctor and I take this seriously I think this has something to say about the human condition and experience and he he really got the ball rolling God, you gotta love this guy for giving it his all and, and doing something so important um, 
And so originally the uh, theory the dreams are just random byproducts of the brain's functioning during REM sleep. Uh, that is still maintained by some scientists today. Uh, and in my opinion, they're just being cautious in terms of, we can't really prove yet what causes dreams. We think we have some great ideas and I'm stepping out on a limb in giving my endorsement to the idea that dreams even have meaning because we think they do, it looks like they do, but how do we know? How do we know for sure? As I say, the proof is in the pudding. If, if something meaningful can be extracted from it, something useful, then even if literally dreams mean nothing, we still had a beneficial experience and the person still got something useful out of it. And I, I'm happy with that. I hope they're happy with that. Uh, back here it says, uh, it is also the theory that we sometimes invoke um, to reassure ourselves when a dream has overwhelmed us with the... Uh, with its meaning to say it was only a dream and a lot of people experience that in waking from nightmares especially thank god it was only a dream i'm not actually being chased or falling or all those other things uh so for freud every dream every dream was meaningful no matter how nonsensical it seems and sometimes those are those are some of the best um and even if we can't really remember very much about it and that, again, that's my process of getting back in there and trying to find those hidden details that end, I think end up being extremely relevant. Um, also here, this is a big one for me. I, I understand opinions differ. If you don't like my content because of this opinion, I, I accept that and I respect, uh, respectfully disagree. In my opinion, there is no such thing as a dream dictionary. <clears throat> there is no one size fits all answer to everything. Uh, that That's not to say that certain things don't have universal relevance in some predictable, and again, as Jung would say, archetypal ways, but you, you, I, my opinion, again, you're wasting your time trying to look your dreams up in a, in a dream dictionary. I don't think it's gonna give you useful insights in, in the same way that my, my process does. And you don't have to listen to me, just find someone else who follows a similar process and actually analyzes the dream on a personal level using relevance to your personal life. Um, so uh, this idea that uh, there is no dream, addiction, uh, dream dictionary um, is uh, relevant to Freud's uh, theory, but uh, Freud also undermined the, the idea of a dream dictionary what am I even saying uh, I'm gonna stop reading this because uh, this doesn't seem to be very well written but it made me have all those other thoughts so we can move on um, back to the article for a conclusion here <clears throat> As I was saying, since antiquity, dreams have been viewed as a source of divination, as a form of reality, as a curative force, and as an extension or adjunct to the waking state, contemporary research focuses on efforts to discover and describe unique, complex biochemical and neuropsychological bases for dreams. Psychoanalytic theorists emphasize the individual meaningfulness of dreams and their relation to personal hopes and fears. Other perspectives assert that dreams convey supernatural meaning and some regard dreaming as nothing more than the normal activity of the nervous system, random firing of the neurons while you sleep. Such variety reflects the lack of any single all-encompassing theory about the nature or purpose of dreams. And uh, before we head out here, I wanted to bring up this page and show you guys, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit so you can see it better. Um, Here's probably uh, one of the best places if you wanted to start looking into Freud's actual method and theory of uh, the, the theory and practice of dream interpretation. Uh, you see it here and then there's um, other editor's notes. Again, this page will be linked at the bottom below. This is, oh, this is actually a PDF, but you can get it online. Um, and in conclusion here, uh, Dreams are often most profound when they seem the most crazy. And I'll tell you, I found that to be true. So that brings us to the end of another episode of Augury, Bibliomancy and Chaos. 
Uh, for more information and for your personal edification, I will be adding all of these links in the comments section below this video. If you enjoy my content, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. But above all, thanks for listening.